Welcome to the Star of Grind. Uh, the great country uh, of Ireland. Uh, at 16, he was uh, awarded uh, one of the most prestigious uh, science awards in the country. Uh, he attended um, MIT for a very short time, then uh, joined a Y Combinator company called Automatic, which was sold uh, less than a year later for five million dollars. Uh, he has since uh, founded Stripe, and he is with us here tonight. So everybody, let's give a big round of applause for Patrick Collison. Here we go. How's that? Yes, go ahead. Cool. That's the that's the introduction you get at work every morning, right? When you come in, or <laughs> not quite. <laughs> Uh, like, oh, Patrick's here. I'm sure someday, someday. Um, so, uh, well, l like I said, we are, uh, I, I specifically am just so excited to to, uh, to be able to have you here tonight. We had Steve Blank here a couple weeks ago, and, uh, you know, I just, uh, I think Stripe is one of these companies that we're really going to be, you know, hearing a lot about over the next couple of years. So just really appreciate you coming. Thank you. So, I'd uh, love to just start and, and talk a little bit about your background. Tell us a little bit about your family and where you're from and, and uh you know, kind of sure. how you grew up. Uh, so I grew up in Ireland, um, I guess it was a, a pretty standard uh, Irish upbringing. Um, sp spent most of my life uh, living in, the, in like this really rural part of Ireland. Uh, it was sort of surrounded by farms and fields and stuff. Yeah. Um, and I mean, this was kind of problematic when, so, so I remember we, we didn't get a computer for a long time. And even when we got a computer, it took a long time before we got uh, internet access. And so I remember renting or borrowing books from the library uh, to like read about the internet because we couldn't actually get the internet. And so there was, there was like a period of about two years when I was reading these amazing books about the internet. And I thought it's so futuristic. Uh, and and then we got the internet, but the the phone line didn't work very well. And so I remember like going to you know these bandwidth test sites, and I got like 0.5k a second. Uh, and so you know the, the workflow is like have a book with you while you use the internet because you go like read a page of your book you'd like look up see if the page had loaded and chances are it hadn't and sure. you went back to the book um, and then eventually for like the last I think three years we managed to get this satellite internet connection because that was basically the only way to connect this like really rural part of Ireland to the internet um, and and that finally worked well and that was like five twelve k broadband but um, the latency was horrible because like the packets had to go like out into space and back down to Germany and so you have like some SSH session and like you know you press a key and like two seconds later it appears but but at least the bandwidth is good so um, most most of my childhood was sort of uh, I played with Lego when I was really young and then I sort of jumped straight to computers and so most of my childhood was either misspent on Lego or computers yeah and when did when did you when did you start really using computers or programming. Um, I picked up PHP, I guess, like like most of the world, it seems, um, first, uh, and I started that when I was 13. Okay. Yeah. And uh, tell me, tell me a little bit about your parents, uh, Lily, Dennis. Is that right? That's right. Um, um, what What were their professions? What did they do? And so, uh, my mom originally trained as a microbiologist, um, and. Uh, and so I guess Ireland is, is, or at least was at the, at the time when I grew up, sort of pretty traditional. Uh, and so when I was, I, was, I was the first child, and so when I was born, uh, Ireland being such a, a Catholic country, she was, she was expected to leave her job and go raise her new kid. Uh, and so, so she has this like wonderful letter from her employer at the time where it's, you know, congratulating her on her fine career and wishing her all the best, you know, raising her kid in the future before she'd like, given any notice <laughs> or anything like that, just it was, it was assumed that you know, she would leave. Um, and so she did anyway, I think in part because she was so pissed off by that letter. Um, <laughs> and, and then so I, she, I guess, you know, stayed at home with me. And then I think it was like about three weeks after I was born, she started a company. Uh, and so I guess I was just like, <laughs> I, I was that boring. At this it's totally normal, yeah, the recovery <laughs> well, no, period, I, I, I think, most I, mothers. I, I, think th I think that this just speaks to how un unstimulating I must have been as a baby. <laughs> um, so so she, she started this, um, this corporate training company. Uh, hmm. And so basically like ISO 9000 or Six Sigma or, um, or all this kind of stuff. Um, and, and that company's still going today. Uh, and, and it's very much not a Silicon Valley startup. Um, it's been profitable every year since it was founded. Hmm. Um, and now, I guess, it's the same age as me, so I suppose 23 years later, uh, I think it employs like 12 or 13 people. Wow. Um, and that's my mom. Um, and dad, dad trained as an electrical engineer. Um, and uh, and bo both my parents, again, sort of very rural Irish upbringing. They, they grew up on farms. Dad was one of the first kids in the family to go to college, 
uh, he went to work for Dell, and then he in was, Ireland. In Ireland, in yeah. Ireland, yeah. Um, and then he decided, um, I think I was about five or so, that he was going to go buy a hotel um, on the shores of this lake in the middle of Ireland, which is how we ended up in this dire internetless, uh, languishing situation. That wasn't one of the upgraded features at the hotel, I guess. There was no internet access there. Or yeah, there, there it came later. It was, it was great. There was none of these like stupid pay twenty dollars a night for, <coughs> for Wi-Fi thing. Um, it was just uh, there was no internet. And so you have you have two brothers, um, your brother John, who works with you at Stripe, who mm -hmm. co-founded the company with you, yep. and your brother Tommy. What uh, just talk about your relationship with with each other? And are are you are you very similar? Or are you very different? Are you? Yeah. So. Um, so John and I are pretty close in age. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're two years apart, John's two years younger. Um, we were, I guess we were similar-ish growing up. Um, I, I got more into programming um, sort of through school and, and John was more into sort of math and chess and stuff. Um, but I guess we were, we were both sort of pretty nerdy. We both sort of read a lot. Um, and we were pretty competitive <laughs> actually. Uh, and so I think it was kind of helpful that um, I eventually sort of went away to college in the US and you know, spend some time away from home because uh, I, I, th I think that sort of allowed us to, to, to develop apart a little bit. And then Tommy uh, is, uh, um, is five years younger than John, uh, and uh, he, he's the one who's actually going to be famous and well known in several years. And so I don't know, maybe, maybe in 10 years' time, people will I think he's already famous. People will stumble across this interview because they're like Googling Tommy Collison <laughs> and they're like Collison makes it turn up or something. Um, he's had more Twitter followers than me since I think he was like 13 or something. <laughs> Um, so mostly it's just embarrassing. So, so um, you, you know, you grew up in this home, uh, you know, entrepreneurial home really, and you're, you, by your mid-teens, you, you start to enter these science, you know, contests and things like that. Tell me how that started, what was the motivation behind that, and, and yeah. what happened? Tell us, you know, how you did. Um, so, so this mostly came out of, well, I guess two, two things. One is uh, this, this kind of science competition was, was very well known and, um, and fairly kind of prestigious within Ireland, and so it just got a lot of media attention and everything. So uh, it, was, it was it was fairly obvious that you sort of would, would love to take part in it. And uh, and a lot of the winning projects that came out of it were, were actually very cool. Um, a couple of years, or like when, when I was in in primary school, uh, which I guess means age you know, ten or so or something like that, um, a project one that was uh, a much faster version of RSA. Uh, but some like fairly kind of significant um, cryptography research, and uh, the girl who did that ended up, you know, going to work with Stephen Wolfram at Wolfram Research, um, and uh, there were there were like a bunch of like pretty substantial mathematics breakthroughs, you know, new theorems, um, and and generally stuff that just like it, as in it didn't seem sort of any way kind of. Um, I, th I think some of these competitions, like for high school students and stuff, have a tendency to seem kind of uh, like condescending or junior or like you know you we pat it on the head for like you know making your volcano model or something sure uh, and, and there was no sense of that it sounds like one of the US ones <laughs> so I, I've never been to any of those but uh, you, you were doing crypt cryptography it's a word I can't even really pronounce very well and <laughs> we're doing the volcano yeah um, <laughs> we're screwed <laughs> well so uh, I, I was very taken with it anyway and so when uh, when I got into programming uh, fairly quickly I started wondering um, if, if I could do anything um, for this and after PHP I tried to learn Java and I found I remember spending like a year trying to learn Java and just finding it so miserable and I, I basically concluded that I just I should do something else and not uh, and not be a programmer um, but then I think it was from the, I stumbled across Python from some essay that somebody wrote, and then when I was like reading the Python mailing list or something, um, people were always referencing Lisp as the inspiration for a lot of things in Python, like you know math and, and reduce and whatever. Uh, and so I went and I looked into Lisp, uh, and Lisp just seemed totally great. Um, <laughs> and so, so I started writing this. Um, I started trying to implement the MSN Messenger protocol. Uh, MSN Messenger was basically the aim of Europe, and like all my friends were on MSN Messenger. Uh, and actually, the, the earlier versions of the MSN Messenger protocol were, were fairly straightforward. So, so I started implementing this. Um, and then sort of I finally got to the point where you could actually like send messages to people. Uh, and, and then and sort of the project sort of was a, or like the, this little prototype thing was now a success, but now I had to sort of figure out you know, what messages the program should actually send. Uh, and so, you know, that, that actually starts to become a pretty pretty interesting problem. And so like the really the, the first version just had like a, you know it, it had a, a repertoire of sort of pre-programmed responses and just sort of picked those at random. And then you realize that like 
not everyone sort of immediately realizes that, that they're talking to a program uh, and they start to like engage it in conversation. Uh, and so I gave it a name, I called it Isaac. Um, and then started like writing these heuristics to try to have it, you know, keep the conversation going for as long as possible. Um, and and that just became this like really this, this, this totally fascinating thing. Uh, and so one of the I'm sure a lot of you guys know of it. Uh, one of the um, the sort of uh, the big challenges in artificial intelligence has been the Turing test, where sort of you uh, you have uh, some human who's able to uh, correspond, you know, through you know, some, some terminal with both a, another human and a computer program. And the Turing test proposed by Alan Turing suggests that, you know, true, in the case of true artificial intelligence, one would not be able to discern, you know, which was the, the program, which is, or excuse me, yeah, which was the program, which is um, the, the human. Um, and, and so now with, uh, with uh, instant messaging, basically, you actually kind of, I mean, people didn't realize they were playing the Turing test, but you kind of had them playing the Turing test, and you're able to sort of implement this massively parallel Turing test. <laughs> uh, and so ended up writing these programs that sort of tried to learn from all the conversations that they were having and, and sort of go as far as they could. And so, you know, built up this, like, enormous database from hundreds of thousands of conversations uh, and, and just basically went down that AI rabbit hole. Uh, and so that's... That was, so some work around that was what I first entered into this competition, and that's that. That was like the first time that I really felt like I'd done something kind of remotely interesting in programming. So, so in 2006, you uh, you apply to MIT. You you attend MIT your first you attend your first semester, and at the time, you and your brother start this company. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so I, I went to MIT. Um, I applied to MIT sort of when I still had a year and a half left in high school, so I, I sort of ended up starting a year early. Um, I actually came out to Stan I, my, my first time ever in the U.S. was I, I came to Stanford for the International Lisp Conference in 2005, uh, and I was just uh, it was like this really eye-opening moment where like there was this other world of, hmm. of American universities basically, um, and so that was that was in like June or something, and I decided basically then that I would just like apply to American schools you know, for the, for the next year, which I guess was kind of outside the spec, but I mean you know, the worst that, that would happen is you know they'd reject you and you could just apply the next year or something, um, and so I did that and it, it, it worked out, and so I started at MIT. Um, but I was kind of a year behind, and I started when I was 17, and so I sort of felt like I just kind of had this spare year, uh, and. W the Irish high school system is pretty bad in a lot of ways, but uh, one thing that's good about it is that you sort of do three years, then this big exam, and then you have this optional gap year before you do sort of two years and then another exam. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gap year is supposed to be a time where you can kind of explore other interests or, you know, just like do some work experience in a career that you think you might want to pursue or go travel the world or whatever it is. Uh, and John, my, my younger brother, was, was kind of currently in this year, and so we both kind of had just lined up with sort of some spare time and we decided that, you know, we might as well try to start a company because it, it seemed kind of interesting. Um, and, and he was how old? Uh, he was 16. Okay. Um, and so we started this company, and, and the the basic idea was that um, we, we we thought eBay was really cool uh, in that sort of by providing kind of liquidity to to use the items, it was just kind of and, and kind of exploiting that possibility for coordination, it was sort of making the world m much more efficient. Um, and uh, but I mean, obviously eBay just Socks. Um, <laughs> I apologize to any eBay. It's okay. We're at AOL. We're not at okay, eBay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I guess the more charitable way of, of saying it is something like, you know, e eBay's rate of improvement had slowed like, in 2006. <laughs> um, uh, For the Americans in the room, it means it sucked. <laughs> so. Uh, so we tried to build, or we decided to build sort of some better version of eBay, and we didn't really have any um, terribly clear ideas of how to go about that, but yeah. we started working on some prototypes, um, and then we applied to Y Combinator, um, and what actually ended up happening is we merged with uh, uh, the com another company started by two guys, um, Harj and Kulbir Tagar, who, um, who, who had built a student marketplace in the UK and kind of basically also wanted to build a better version of eBay. So the four of us uh, came together in May of 2007 to, to work on Octomatic, and yeah, the goal was to, to build a better eBay. And how, how did that, just tell us how that process came together? Was that something where after you met, because you applied to Y Combinator with this right. original idea, yep. and then was it something where Paul is like, hey, yo, you gotta, you got to meet these other yeah, two so guys, he, or how did he, it work? He basically suggested that we talk to them and sort of figure out if there was any, any ways in which we could work together, and like pretty rapidly after meeting, we decided that it, it made sense to work together. And they had sort of spent a long time working on this. They had, I mean, they successfully launched this, this marketplace, um, and they, 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 we really felt that sort of they had a very good understanding of it, and you know, we, we liked the idea of working with them. They yeah. seem pretty good, um, and and actually now, um, Harge, um, 
is a partner at Y Combinator. Sure. Yeah. And so you so you go through you went through you actually went through the Y Combinator program. You guys moved here. That's right. We we moved out here, um, and we we got this like small little apartment in San Francisco, and yeah. uh, and and went to work basically. Um, and, and and that was sort of really the that was my first time sort of spe spending any significant amount of time on the West Coast and, and sort of learning how like startups worked and uh, like really Optimatic was just like this this incredibly sort of foreshortened introduction to like startup land. It was like this whirlwind tour and that you know came out and sort of we started working on this product. We raised some money from angel investors. Uh, we launched the product. Um, uh, you know it, it did reasonably well and people liked it and, and then it was acquired and like all of that happened sort of. Uh, from from incorporation to acquisition, like ten months, and so Octomatic never left sort of a huge wow. mark in the world, but it was, a, it was an incredible learning experience. I mean, you guys, and 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 I mean, it was big news because you were you and your brother were so young, right? And um, I mean, you you were all over the UK. I mean, there was just a ton of press. Did you did you feel? You know, how did it feel coming out of that? Did you yeah. feel like this? How did it feel? Uh, to be honest, I always felt it was a little bit misplaced. Um, in that, uh, I mean. Th there was a great sort of learning experience for us. I don't think that Automatic ever, uh, 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 yeah, it was, it was a great learning experience, but it, it never sort of left any huge mark on the world. Um, yeah. And so, uh, I don't know, I, I've never been sort of all that enthusiastic with sort of it being interesting simply because we were so young. I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I feel like there are, uh, we're we're sort of very lucky where sort of circumstances aligned and like I've been out here and I sort of knew Paul a little bit through Lisp and stuff where where sort of we managed to go through Y Combinator and sort of things worked out. But I, I don't think we basically I don't think we did anything all that special. And so you sell this com you sell the company and did did you move to Canada to actually be a part of the company? Yeah. So, so I, I moved and became the director of engineering for the <laughs> company um, and spent uh, about a year in Canada. Okay. And um, so you spend a year in camera. Your 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 brother goes back to school, right? He went back and he finished uh, a school in Ireland. And um, we're, we're kind of lucky. And this kind of gets back to the competitive aspect in that uh, I, I actually did this sort of, in order to graduate early to start college. I did the the British sort of leaving school exam at the A levels, and he did the Irish ones. And so we sort of never competed head to head, which was kind of lucky for me because he ended up getting the uh, the the highest score in history in these exams. Wow. Yeah. Must, he just really guy. sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so you go through this next year. You're you're working as director of engineering. Mm -hmm. He goes to Harvard, yep. right? And then you, are you guys are you? You're talking this whole time. Are you saying, hey, okay, we're gonna, you know, what's the next thing? What are we gonna do? Or where where is your head at that point? You're so, you're not you're not gonna stay in Canada forever. I'm, right. I'm sure. So right. Yeah, we should have. I mean, obviously, kind of kept in touch and everything. And then um, I decided to go back to MIT because I sort of, uh, like, I felt like this, uh, you know, I was going to the end of this kind of one-year experiment, right, from, from you know, looking at what it would be like to start a company. Uh, and I guess ne neither, neither of us were kind of sure that we didn't want to sort of go down the academic route. Like, maybe sure. we should try to become professors or something. Um, and, uh, and so I went back to MIT. John was at Harvard. Um, and... Uh, and we just uh, you know had some side projects going on the side. Um, I think the the one that was most um, at least most fun to work on was um, when the when the iPhone came out. There was um, there was no SDK initially, uh, but uh, uh, I, I was walking down actually the street in Vancouver with my friend. And we sort of realized that uh, the the iPhone was actually powerful enough and had enough storage space that you could store a complete copy of Wikipedia on the iPhone. And so you could basically actually implement like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, and uh, and so I think it was uh, December of, of 2007. Um, uh, um, my my friend managed to get like a working kind of jailbroken iPhone uh, toolchain, uh, yeah. so like this hacked version of like GCC that could you know cross compile to ARM on the iPhone, and he just like wrote some header files, kind of guessing the method signatures of the <laughs> the UI kit selectors. Uh, and he sort of showed me at like 3 a.m. one morning, you know, like a, a working Hello World app on the iPhone. And this was back when Apple still maintained that, you know, there were only going to be web apps and only like the the, um, the apps that they were actually built internally at Apple. They were sort of the only native apps that would be allowed to run on the iPhone. Um, but so this friend, who, uh, Brian, who, who now actually works with Stripe, uh, he, he got this tool, tool chain running. And so we decided to like try to build this, um, this Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy app. Uh, and this was just like a ton of time, you know, staring at ARM disassembly and everything. But but it finally worked, uh, and and we released it. And um, 
And it was terrible because we hosted the Wikipedia dumps ourselves. And so it ended up getting like a ton of downloads, and each one was two gigs. And so it was basically like I was hosting it on Slicehost, and there was this like overflow on Slicehost where like it just couldn't show me how much bandwidth that we, how much bandwidth was actually being consumed. Um, <laughs> So, but, but the project as a whole was pretty fun. I think it, um, it ended up getting like a, a couple hundred thousand installs on the iPhone, again, back before the App oh. Store. And then, um, and then it was actually ported to the, the $100 laptop, like the, the OLPC, because sure. I mean, these are being shipped to, you know, like Everywhere. Peru and India, or whatever. Yeah. And obviously, most of these people don't actually have internet access, and so this is kind of how you can read Wikipedia without it. That's really cool. Um, so anyway, we're, we're sort of, John and I were kind of working on side projects like this, um, but, um, and you know, somewhere along the way, strike came along. Yeah. So, um, so just tell us a little bit about that. So, you, you you're, you're, you're implementing. You're trying to actually solve. You know, you solve this problem yourself, right? Mm -hmm. You're actually implementing merchant accounts and like trying to set up a, a payments on your on one of these projects. Or so how did it come about? So actually, what happened is, um, so one of the projects that I'd worked on uh, back a few years previously was just trying to build a, a better web framework in Lisp. Um, and you know, I was. I guess I was right uh, that you know better web frameworks are interesting, but I was very wrong in thinking that like anyone would use, li use would use Lisp. Um, but I, I guess sort of by 2009 or 10 or whatever it was, uh, we'd both sort of build tons of web applications, but we'd never charge for any of them. Um, <laughs> like we'd literally never charge for any of the software that we'd built on the web, uh, and we started sort of wondering why that was, um, and. And we sort of looked back and we realized that we'd actually sort of started applying for merchant accounts at like various points or we'd sort of like taken the first steps for like integrating with PayPal, but just it never quite been sort of the biggest priority at any one time and just the net result is that we had never sort of taken a single payment on the web. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we were sort of really taken with uh, what was kind of happening in, in other industries where there were these kind of very developer oriented services come on, coming along and sort of building these really nice abstraction layers over sort of some particular piece of infrastructure and just making it really easy to go and, and, and do something. So I mean, the obvious examples are things like Linode or Slicehost or EC2 <coughs> for hosting, uh, also obviously Twilio for telephony, just like a lot of these companies. And so um, I think it was October of 2009 or something, we sort of had this idea that you know maybe we, maybe it would be kind of interesting to, to build slice hosts for for payments hmm. and that that's how we thought of it it was a slice host for payments um, I, I guess a bunch of you have probably like used some of these hosting providers but at the time EC2 was still sort of very bare bones and there wasn't really much of a, a web interface and it was like you had to use all these command line tools to administer it um, whereas slice host had this like really nice slick GUI where you could just start like you could like click build server and like 60 seconds later, you'd have a server, uh, and we sort of wanted that like magical, instantaneous experience for payments. Sure, and so, uh, so uh, Paul Graham has talked about you used you guys as this example is of you know really attacking very very difficult problems and people that he he, he uses comparison of how many like recipe websites he's gotten, you know how many pitches he's gotten over the years versus no one ever pitched this idea. So and because it was so big, it uh, was you, you're solving such a huge problem. Um, and wh where did you even start? I mean, where, where does something like that even begin? Um, so, so we didn't really know uh, where to start, uh, and like I, I definitely wouldn't pretend that we did. Uh, and I mean, I would have started by like crying, in, you know, in the fetal position or something. I mean, it's like, you know, uh, did you? It w it's I just you so, so, and your brother, so, yeah, right? So, 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 so basically, we faked it. Um, so what we did was um, we decided to go on holiday uh, and just like go hack somewhere. Uh, and maybe, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name, um, but there's this guy, uh, uh, Mache, and I'm gonna totally, um, like, mess he up He may be his, here, so. Yeah, I was gonna, I'm gonna totally mess up his surname, but it, it's something like Sedlowski or Chedlowski or something like that. I apologize, Mache, if you ever see this. Uh, his website is idlewords.com, and, uh, and he's a really good writer, and he, um, he wrote this, these, this series of blog posts about Buenos Aires uh, and how it's like the, the best place ever to go and hack because it's really cheap and everything's open really late and there's like Wi-Fi everywhere <laughs> and the climate's really nice and everything. And so John and I were facing this winter in Cambridge, Massachusetts, yeah. uh, which, is, which is definitely not like that in, in basically any respect. Uh, and so we decided to go to Buenos Aires and just um, like hack all day in cafes on trying to build a prototype here. And so we did that, and it turns out to be basically exactly as described. And so, if ever like you just want to go and like work on something sort of single-mindedly for a month, I cannot recommend uh, Buenos Aires more highly. We spent like ten dollars a day, and the weather was gorgeous. And like bizarrely, all of the cafes have Wi-Fi for no reason that I can discern. Like much more than is the extent here. And hmm. um, <laughs> all the restaurants open really late. Uh, in that we, we were turned away from restaurants at like nine o'clock in the evening because it was too early. Um, 
all the bars are open until like 5 a.m. People only start going to bars at 2 a.m. and nobody gets up before midday. And so basically, it's like an entire city on a hacker schedule. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and we were like the worst tourists ever in that I still have not seen like a single site or anything in Buenos Aires. We just like got up, went to a cafe, and like hanged all day. Um, and at the end of that, we had the first prototype of Stripe. Um, after a month. After yeah, after a month, or I guess we, we like the first we had the first production user actually about a week after going to Buenos Aires, um, and what we did was we just like uh, called up a friend who worked at a payment processing company and said you know is it okay if we just kind of send a couple of accounts your way, and uh, and we sort of built sort of this really nice uh, kind of you know the, the, this nice API and sort of you know interface for setting up accounts or whatever, and then you know when you sort of clicked create account or whatever rather than uh, you know an account actually being created sort of in the financial infrastructure you know. However, that worked. We had no idea. We just like went and called our friend, um, <laughs> which you know scaled to at least a couple of users. Uh, and so we um, and you set it up all manually behind yeah, the scenes. Yeah, it was totally manual. Um, and uh, and I mean, you know, at this point, uh, like we, we had you know, literally two users, uh, yeah. and both of them were like good friends of ours. Uh, and and so Paul Bukite has this great story about um, about building Gmail, uh, where like he kind of repurposed um, the Google Groups code, which predates Gmail, uh, to build Gmail. And so uh, like he built the first working prototype in an afternoon, and you know it just uh, it loaded all of his email into like the Google Groups interface, and he could kind of browse in the Google Groups interface. And he like showed his friends, and they were like clicking through it, and they're like, oh, this is great, you know, but it would be really awesome if instead of viewing you know your email, I could view mine. Uh, <laughs> and, and it was this like very kind of direct uh, user request driven development, um, and it was sort of similar to this with Stripe in that we sort of like built the API that allows you to charge credit cards, and so you know went on, on user requests from there. And so uh, Ross Boucher was actually the very first user of Stripe. <laughs> um, uh, he was at a company called Tuesday North at the time, uh, and uh, and he's like, you know, this this API is great, you know, but what would be really awesome is if you know you actually transfer the money into my bank account after I you know charge credit cards. <laughs> like, right, fair. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and and you know, similar requests like this. Um, and so. So what it didn't actually it, it didn't actually it didn't go anywhere because I thought you were setting this up on the back end for him or no? Yeah, I I, I can't remember. It's all fuzzy yeah, math yeah, yeah. at this um, point. But 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 it was very. Um, it was very much driven by basically you know what things they bugged us to build. Um, sure. And so we, we launched this prototype, and, and again, I, I sort of, you know, it, the, the strength. You're not back from Argentina, or, or yes. Yeah, so, so so by the time we say got back from Argentina at the end of January, um, sort of the the product existed and it actually existed in sort of fairly close form to what Stripe is today. Like just this this really simple notion that you can you can go to a website like by filling it in a really minimal amount of information, you can start accepting credit cards immediately on the internet. And the, like the, the, the fundamental idea is that it should be possible to launch a website and accept payments on it within like 30 minutes. And yeah. you know, before Stripe was um, you know, uh, this multi-day. Yeah, it's week. Yeah, yeah, it's, exactly. it's um, five, seven business days, right, something. Right. Uh, and I mean, th that's when sort of it got hard, right? Because kind of figuring out what the sort of software sh side of Stripe should look like, I mean, you, you can kind of imagine it. But then, like, how do you possibly reconcile all of that with, like, the financial infrastructure and merchant accounts and gateways and laws and PCI? And, like, and they're just, like, the words we knew. Um, and, uh, and so we went back to school, and we sort of finished the next semester, and we decided to, to work on it um, uh, in Palo Alto over the next summer. And I guess that's when we that that's when we started working full time on Stripe. I guess about a year and a half ago. Okay, and yeah, I mean, so uh, for some background, I'm sure a lot of people in this room are, are have dealt with this. But one of my first jobs in my first startup job in college was like signing up or like servicing merchant accounts, and it was oh, really? yeah, and it was like two thousand dollars up front to set it mm -hmm. up, and it was like another hundred or something a month. Yep. And then there and then the fees kicked in. Yep. And so it was just like for a small business. Yeah. It was insane. I yeah, mean, it was yeah. absolutely insane. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the fee schedules for many of our competitors run to like more than one page. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I mean, it, uh, like, I think every now and again you just stumble across an industry that, uh, like, the, the online payments industry was just like an unusually compelling example, I think, of, of an entire industry that is going to have its lunch eaten. And, you know, whether that is Stripe or something else, like, just this is not how the world should work. Uh, and, yeah, I think. Um, I mean, I, th I think it'll be very good for the world when fee schedules, you know, no longer run to two pages. So you come back, you 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 finish your semester of school, you come back here at the beginning of the summer, two thousand ten. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 
and um, so you, it's still just you and your brother. Mm -hmm. And then what is the next series of events? You you reach out to like to Paul in that in that yeah. team, or are you still just kind of building no. on your own? Or so so I guess two things happened. Um, one is uh, I guess like a lot of startups, we we at this point actually still looked at Stripe as as very much a um, kind of a side project uh, in that we like we're also working on these iPhone apps and whatever, and just like Stripe was another sort of like interesting thing we had going on the side, um, and. But that, that, that changed over that summer. Um, and what sort of changed was we, we thought more about, um, I guess we, we just thought more about sort of the problem of transactions and the internet and, and more about sort of the internet in general, like what kind of things are holding the internet back. And it sort of struck us that, um, that sort of, like you think of Google as, uh, as really kind of solving the problem of like search and the internet. And like if you think of search in the web, you know, it's very clear that sort of we should have a good solution to search on the web and, and you know, Google does a reasonable job. But, you know, maybe you could do better than Google, but, but there's like, there's a pretty solid start at least. Um, and similarly, you think of like social and the web and, uh, and, and, you know, again, say Facebook, you know, perhaps we can do something better, but, you know, pretty good job. Um, and then if you look at sort of just payments or even more generally kind of like the economic foundation of the web, it's just, it's really, it's really shaky and there's just like nothing there. And I mean, like PayPal to some degree, I think was at one point on a kind of trajectory to build this, but but they've kind of you know they they never really got there, um, and and I mean it, it took us a long time to realize this. It took us kind of six months, but but I think that's actually a really big deal in that uh, I mean the web is and the internet are are, are still very young, um, but but sort of of all the things we buy and sort of all the, the like all the transactions we engage in, still only like a minuscule fraction of those happen on the internet. And like when you think about it, it's just like really hard to buy something on the internet today. Like it's 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 crazy how kind of manual it is. You're like punching your credit card number digit by digit and sure. go to these multi-stage checkout processes. Uh, it, it's incredibly hard to start accepting payments online. Even if you start accepting payments online, it's really hard to transact across borders. Uh, in that, I mean, if you have a credit card, I mean that's great. You can buy from a U.S. user, but I mean, good luck buying from somebody in you know like in Russia or China or Brazil or whatever it is. Uh, similarly, if you're a consumer, like, I mean, if you're an American, you can buy from other American websites, but if you're, like, a, a Guatemalan or an Indonesian, I mean, you're, you have to, like, you're, you're restricted to, like, your, your small little market. Um, and I don't think this is kind of going to remain the case, um, in that I think that, like, there, there will be and there should be sort of, like, a really robust, reliable, simple, straightforward, powerful, like, economic layer for the Internet. Um, and sort of whether or not Stripe builds that, I think that, you know, we, we sort of realized that at least the problem space is, is pretty interesting and pretty meaningful. And so, but we were kind of coming at it very much from this, um, this, you know, fairly, uh, this, this kind of humble beginning of, yeah. of like, you know, building slice of for payments. We, you know, we at least became convinced that there's something there, like this might be a somewhat rich theme. Well, and what's interesting too is that you didn't start out, you know, you and John didn't sit down and say, you know what, we're going to build a, you know, a, a payment platform. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was it was it actually sounds like you were doing some of these other side projects that were that were more interesting to you because you're spending mm -hmm. more time and they were more fun. Mm -hmm. And then as you continue to think about it, as it evolved over time, over a yes. span of six or eight months, yes. it was like, wow, actually, this thing we created has real potential. Yes. Um, and, and this this kind of leads into something I want to talk to you because we, we constantly hear like, you know, Paul constantly talks about work on big problems. Mm -hmm. People also talk about work on something you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder, you know. Is payment something you're passionate about? I oh, mean, is it absolutely? It, yes. it is. Yes. Um, I mean, I think that it's like it's it's so like it's it's the fundamental enabler, uh, as in you're uh, um, you're you're enabling people to like to make a livelihood, to, to like get into business. Uh, and I think there there are actually very few things that are sort of as fundamentally kind of interesting as that. And. I mean, I think the payments sort of at its core is pretty interesting and, and meaningful, but I think like especially on the internet because uh, like in a lot of ways, uh, like you know many classes of payments are sort of a pretty solved problem. And so like there are tons of people sort of competing with, you know, what's the next way of, uh, of like buying a cup of coffee at Starbucks? And like Starbucks is a mobile app that allows you to you know pay for your coffee and Google are doing Google Wallet and like there's all this NFC stuff and like you know probably in ten years, I will not hand my credit card to the cashier. i'll I'll do something else. But, but fundamentally, like, I'll buy my cup of coffee at Starbucks. Whereas on the internet, a lot of the transactions that are going to happen uh, sort of 
uh, they're still to be defined. We, sure. we still don't really know what, what, what's possible and like what things can be built. And to the extent that we sort of make the experience of sort of transacting on the internet better, that just means all this new stuff will be created. And so if we build like the better way of buying a coffee at Starbucks, the world I think will still look basically the same. Whereas on the internet, when you solve this problem, I think we'll actually have a pretty different internet. Uh, and so I think it's, uh, I'm not sure, uh, like it's not immediately obvious to me what, what a more interesting problem to solve on the internet would be. And you've, you've made this comment that 10 years from now, the things that will be accepting payments, that it, it's, it's new things. It's not, you know, the majority of the payments that are coming, it's not going to be on what we're using today. It's going to be on something new. And so you're basically right. creating the infrastructure and creating the platform for that. Is that right? That's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so you come back to Silicon Valley. Um, you're continue, you continue, you start, say, do you, you finally say, okay, we're going to focus on this thing. Mm -hmm. And then, and then yeah. what happened? What happened after that? So then, um, uh, I, I mean, by and large, uh, we like set up keyboards and like typed, um, and like 99.9% .9 of the time was, was spent doing that. Um, and we, I guess by the time the summer started, we had a waiting list of, I can't remember how many people, but like, like some number of thousand people. Uh, who and this is just spreading, I mean, how do you get a thousand just like people? Word of mouth. Word of mouth, you have a, yeah. you have a website that has a sign up page. It, Put your email here, exactly. we'll email like you when it's ready. told other friends and this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and, but, but we couldn't, we couldn't have them use Stripe because, uh, I mean, well, I just, I guess, told you sort of how the account creation process actually happened in the background. Sure. Uh, and so we, we sort of like convinced ourselves that there might be something interesting here, um, but now we have to sort of actually go and build the infrastructure to make it work. And so we decided at the end of that summer that we would sort of go and take this seriously. We'd go and build that infrastructure and figure out, you know, whatever it is that we need to learn, um, and and actually launch it properly. Uh, and so we took some some investment. Um, uh, y Combinator, uh, Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, Sequoia, Andreessen Horowitz, and a few others invested in our seed round. Um, Anybody and we've heard of? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and then we basically spent the next, uh, I think it was 14 months, uh, building the infrastructure that could actually make this work. So from like wow. August 2010 to the end of September 2011, it was like building infrastructure. And then we, we finally launched it to the public I think like I think it was the 30th of September, so 2011. 2011. So like just over six months ago. So uh, w walking back to that point of raising, t tell tell us how the, how do those types of conversations start? So you already know Paul; they've invested in you. Uh -huh. Some of these maybe were some of your previous investors, but it, like you go and you meet with Peter Thiel, and and what happens? Is it you know to walk yeah. us through you know your first meeting with Peter Thiel? Um, so. So I remember being very critical of PayPal and then sort of halfway through the meeting being like, hmm, maybe not the best right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wrong deck. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you know, um, mostly I remember him thinking that a lot of the things we were doing that I thought were a bad idea, him thinking they were a good idea and sort of vice versa. Uh, and, and that being sort of pretty interesting. And so uh, at the time, uh, we, at the time, we sort of wanted to have this forcing function uh, that uh, to, to sort of encourage us to make the product really good. Uh, and so we, did, we, we charged 5% plus 30 cents for every transaction, which is like way more than anyone else charged uh, to process online payments. Uh, and, and sort of our thinking was that, well, we don't want anyone to use us like, because of the cost. And so rather than try to be even competitive, we just priced it like, way higher than everyone else. And kind of until people were willing to use it and like, pay that large premium, the product sort of wasn't sufficiently better. Um, mm -hmm. And but we were sort of but we didn't really think of it as sort of like a, a viable long term strategy. Uh, and I remember Peter arguing that, that it quite possibly could be, and that, hmm. you know, that that could be like a really interesting business model. Um, yeah, basically you'd provide a better customer service, better experience, right. and you could charge a premium right, and for just it. Have a, like a fundamentally different business model to like every other parent's mm -hmm. company. Um, and and I, I guess I also remember Peter being. Um, just like smart and decisive, and so within like two hours of meeting, he had agreed to invest. Um, and we did like tons of other meetings, and like lo lots of people had told us that like this was not even possible, or like the million reasons we would fail. Whereas Peter, pretty emphatically, was like, "Okay, I will invest." Hmm. Um, and I think, you know, I mean that that I think really changed our trajectory. And so you you also took Y Combinator money, but you didn't go mm -hmm. through the program again. You'd been through it, right? And that's right. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, we we I guess Automatic had gone through Y Combinator and. Um, uh, I mean, Stripe sort of already existed, and I guess uh, we, um, for, for no particularly good reason, actually, we, yeah. we didn't end up going through the program again. Like, I think kind of if I were to go back and look at that decision again, it would be kind of 50-50 as to whether or not we should. But, um, 
which yeah, we, we didn't go through at that point. Can you talk about what, what are some of the, I mean, we, you know, Y Combinator, you know, it's clear they provide, you know, financing, mm -hmm. there's some mentorship there, but what, what are the, as somebody that's, that's now, you know, been a part of two companies that have, that have been invested through that program, yep. what, are, what are some of the tangible benefits that, that people get from, or intangible benefits right. that you don't even think about they get through going through Y Combinator? Um, so there's a bunch of them. Um, I think that, like, for, for us, one thing that was really valuable was um, having all these alumni and just being part of this network of, of other startups. I mean, we were building a service that, uh, like, whose initial user, users, at least, included a bunch of other startups. And so having kind of all these other people who we knew that were building startups, excuse me, and being able to say to them, oh, you guys should use Stripe, instead of having them want to help us because we're a fellow Y Combinator company, I mean, that was just super valuable for us. Um, in that basically other Y Combinator, y Combinator users were our users, and I think maybe our first 10 or 20 users were all YC companies. Um, so that was really helpful. Um, uh, I guess I presume like many, if not most of the people here are, have startups themselves, and you know, it turns out that startups are really hard. Um, and, and just like having a bunch of other people around you who, who are sort of you know, doing the same thing and like get that, I think is really, really nice and valuable. Um, but actually, I think that the, like, Y Combinator talk quite a bit about, I, th I think more than, than most um, sort of similar incubators or whatever you call that class of like seed funding entities, it, um, I think that they talk sort of more than most about what their value is and what they do. And they have actually this like really detailed document on the YC site describing just like what YC is and what, what you do. Um, and, and they talk about sort of some of the benefits, like that they sort of they have a ton of data, like they see hundreds of companies, and so you know they can just kind of apply sort of aggregated other companies' experience to your experience, and and just sort of provide helpful data-driven advice in that way, or the alumni network or whatever it is. Um, but I feel like YC can't actually sort of kind of it's difficult for them to talk about the biggest advantage of YC, which is simply that Paul and their partners are really smart. Uh, and I feel like they can't really sort of write this document that sort of, you should do YC because we're really smart. Um, <laughs> but I think that's actually kind of the, the best reason to do YC, uh, in that, uh, like Paul initially and the other partners and now the other partners who've joined are just really, really, really good. Um, and I mean, I guess with Stripe, we've been kind of lucky where we got to, yeah, or like do get to work with like lots of good investors, but like there's no question that YC are, are at the, in the like very top tier. And when you say good and smart, you're, are you talking about like product feedback or, uh, you know, execution or, uh, you know, technology or right. what, what exactly do you mean yeah, by that? Yeah, so there was this, um, I got a month ago or something, there was this meme going around Facebook of like what my mom thinks I do and like what my friends think I do and like whatever else for like all these different professions. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I feel like you know the world thinks startup founders are like thinking all these strategic thoughts and like reclining in their chair thinking you know how to deal with the next big threat or whatever it is and um, or like what the next you know giant breakthrough will be. Whereas in fact most of your time is spent you know like this particular thing is broken and the person who is going to fix it like had to go home and I like you have to fix it or like this investor has this question you need to produce this document and like it's just like it's it's the, you know all these distractions one after another. Like I think basically the experience of doing a startup is just like dealing with distractions you know in serial. Um, and, uh, and, and I mean, sometimes the issues are actually huge, like you're trying to like, you know, close this round or this big deal and there's, you know, some you know, like recalcitrant investor or like stressful thing happening, or it's, you know, I, uh, I don't know how to talk to this customer or like whatever it is, but you know, it really kind of spans the gamut. Um, and I think like to your question, like what are they actually good at? I think, you know, Paul and the other partners are really good at like, just like getting that. I mean, they've done companies and uh, they've seen this happen like literally thousands of times in other companies. And so whether the issue is like closing this round or doing this big deal or this acquisition or whatever, or it's just, well, like how should the sign up button work? Um, mm -hmm. they're, uh, they have pretty good advice. And that, that's, I mean, that, that has made a big difference to Stripe. T talk about just a little bit and then we'll get back to Stripe. Um, talk a little bit about Paul Graham. You, you, uh, you know, you know Paul Graham probably as well as as, as any of the YC founders do. Uh, what makes Paul Graham specifically so good? What makes him unique? Um, and uh, you know, how how has he helped you in your startups? Um, hmm. He kind of reminds me a bit of Peter Thiel, actually. Um, he uh, he just makes these surprising connections and comes up with these like surprising ideas uh, that. Um, 
you know, that, that are things that I am not part of. Uh, and I, I mean, like, I, I guess I feel like lots of investors are sort of pretty good at the kind of quotidian things like, you know, helping you close other deals or, you know, you have a question of, you know, how some, how should I grant options or like what lawyer should I use? I mean, there are lots of investors that I, that I think can give you pretty good advice there. Um, like usually I find the conversations that are most kind of useful with Paul are like, uh, thinking about some like totally new area or something and go to Paul and he just, I, I come back with sort of 10, uh, t 10 ideas that I had not thought of. And like some of them are really outlandish and, and like terrible ideas and you know, some of them are good. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know, I think that like both Paul Graham and Peter Thiel sort of have this property where they, they sort of look at the world kind of sideways and just like see it slightly differently to everybody else. And uh, I'm not sure if that's kind of an acquired thing or that's a kind of a consequence of having seen so many other companies or something they actually kind of explicitly put effort into or whatever, but regardless of sort of what it is, I think that's, I don't know, that, that's the thing that most strikes me about Paul. Is there anything that he's not very good at? Um, hmm. um, He's not, take he's that not, as a he's no. Not, he's not very good at. Uh, uh, he's not very good at sort of feigning interest um, in <laughs> in something that he doesn't care about. And so, uh, you know, if he'll get like really taken with like some particular thing that you you know you could do with the business, and you'll be like, um, you, and and then you know you'll move on to some other topic. And for example, say you're talking about like how you should issue options, and uh, and now you're like thinking about how you should issue options, and like. Paul is sort of ten minutes back in the conversation, thinking, and you know what you should really do, um, and and that's actually you know this like giant take over the world plan with you know some like path that you have never thought of. Um, yeah, great. So uh, so you launched six months ago, and tell us. So at this at this point, how big is the company? Um, you know, you guys were based down here. You've now moved to the city, but yep. what uh, you know, how, it's it's more than just you and. Mm -hmm. You and your brother actually, and, and the guy from 280 North joined your company, right? right. Your first yeah. customer actually joined your company. Yes. Um, actually, several of our customers joined Stripe. Um, so uh, one of the things that turned out to be really nice about building kind of a, a service for their startups is that uh, you, you meet all these people who you'd like love to work with. Um, and so uh, we've repeatedly had the experience of uh, like somebody builds something on top of Stripe and, uh, and sort of over the course of just them building on Stripe, we get the chance to sort of interact with them a lot. And... Um, uh, and we we're just like really impressed, uh, and you know, like, you know, building this business on top of Stripe is great, but you know, we, we'd we'd love to <laughs> to have you actually just like build Stripe itself. Um, and so uh, now we're so I think we launched we were eight people or so. Um, now I think we're twenty three. Um, and like of say the I, th I think it was eight that we were when we launched. I think that. Four or five were Stripe users, and so that's how um, how we came across them. Um, and uh, and I guess of the uh, the twenty something, the the vast majority are, are engineers, uh, and so mostly. I mean, wh wh when we launched, um, uh, like I don't I don't think Stripe is actually sort of like all that incredible an idea or anything. And I think it's kind of an idea that's been in the air for a while. It's just like, finally, who will make payments just like not really suck on the internet? And so I think that the reaction to Stripe to a large degree was like, oh great, payments now like don't suck anymore. Uh, and and since we launched, uh, it's, it's very much been just like trying to keep up with the growth where like it turned out there are all these people who want to use a payment service that doesn't suck. Um, and so uh, just like there've been tons of sites um, going live on Stripe every day, and yeah, mostly we've just been trying to keep up with that. And uh, and so you grew one to a thousand just based on word of mouth. How have you grown? You know, has it been the same? Have you guys, it, it, you it's, it's, it's all been word of mouth so far, or I mean word of mouth or like people writing about us on blogs or like uh, the thing that we really like and, um, and, and you know, is really kind of meaningful for us when it happens is sort of when people just like write about their experience of integrating Stripe uh, because uh, I mean that that's like that's the goal. We just want to make it super simple uh, for people to to build a business on the web, uh, and like that is the thing we're kind of always asking ourselves: like, how could we make it easier for somebody to start building a business on the internet? Uh, and and yeah, we, we we've done no marketing so far, um, or, or actually we, we we started like running some limited ads mm -hmm. and like Stack Overflow and stuff like a week ago. But like, up to that, it was it was all either. Um, word of mouth or stuff that our users wrote about Stripe. Um, and again, I think that's, uh, we, we sort of intentionally held off marketing for a long time because 
again, it's sort of that forcing function again. Like if our users aren't talking about Stripe, well, I mean, then we should make Stripe more awesome, like until they do. Uh, and I think that sort of like marketing and like sales teams and all that kind of stuff, they can be sort of really useful kind of accelerants uh, when you when you're really confident that you have the product right. But I think that uh, it's it's I think that um, I came across this this quote I think it was yesterday from. Um, Eugene Feiner about like how even turkeys can uh, can fly in a high wind. Um, and I think there's kind of something like that for, <laughs> for startups, um, where like you know with enough sales and marketing you can make even like a really crappy product successful. Uh, and so I think we're sort of but by not doing any marketing for a long time, it's you know making sure that we're like not this like hapless floundering turkey. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so I, I mean now we I guess we've some nice. Um, suggested evidence that you know people like the product and stuff and so you know na now we're much more okay with sort of like I guess there's two sides to it like on the one hand you want to make sure you're not a turkey um, but then when you're like okay I'm not a turkey uh, the other trap I think that you can fall into is I think a lot of um, engineers and I mean I, I see this trade in myself um, kind of have this sort of um, I don't know, like this solipsism or kind of this uh, this kind of self-centeredness or something where like I'm going to build my beautiful code you know over here in the corner and like I'll wait for the world to discover me and yeah I, I'm just going to focus on all these technical problems and um, because I think you, you really have to go and like engage with the world and like talk to people and like tell them about what you're doing and why it's meaningful and everything and and yeah you don't want to do that sort of or like there is some value I think in holding off doing that initially or just like not kind of pushing it too hard because it's it's really nice to sort of to, to, to wait till it gets to the point where people will actually sort of discover you. But once you've got to that point and like you think that you actually have a thing, then I think you should go and tell the world and, and like really bring it to people. Um, and so I think that you know over the, the coming years we'll, we'll we'll try to do that more. But um, but I think there's some value in holding off for a while. So you're currently in in how many countries are you in? Which countries are you in? Um, well, so you can look at it in two ways. Um, so if you if you have a Visa or like Mastercard or whatever branded credit card, it will work with the Stripe user. So we have like purchasers from you know, almost every country in the world. Um, however, if you want to accept payments with Stripe and like sign up with Stripe, uh, you have to be based in the U.S. today, um, and and that is like the biggest bug with Stripe right now. Uh, in that, I mean, I mean, the whole promise of the internet is you know we'll break down borders and like there will be this incredible like shiny you know global ex real time exchange of information, uh, and sort of we're trying to sort of build a concomitant um, economic layer, but I mean it's it, it's frankly just broken right now and that like you can only accept payments if you happen to be sort of physically resident in the, in the United States and that just that makes no sense on the internet um, and so we're working on fixing it uh, and I think that so if, at least when we launched I think that a majority of the people working at Stripe um, were born outside of the US and like grew up not being US citizens and so but it was just you and your brother at the company, though, right? Well, well, no. I mean, when we launched, and we were like whatever eight people or nine or whatever it was. Um, like even then, it, there were like a ton of non-U.S. citizens. Yeah. Um, or people who at least didn't start out being U.S. citizens. And um, and I mean, like the thing, like when you build a startup, you I mean you always care, like uh, you, you you always want your mom to be able to use it. And like, sure. You know, whenever like I, I talk to my mom about Stripe, she's like, "Can I use Stripe yet?" I'm like, "No, mom." <laughs> um, and <laughs> uh, and so yeah, I mean we. You're working on it. We're, we're working on it. I think, yeah. you know, you, even now... You have a big announcement here, right? Exclusive? <laughs> I wish. Exclusive. I wish. Um, oh, damn. I think now at 20-something people, Stripe is still like 50% non-US, and so... Um, You're cranking we, on we, it. We feel this bug pretty acutely. Yeah. Um, so I, we will get to you, the audience's questions here in just a minute. I just want to ask you one more thing. You know, um, Paul talks a lot about going after real problems, difficult problems, and... Uh, I reached out to your uh, to your younger, soon to be very very famous brother Tommy, and uh, he's 16. And I, I he got this email back from him, and, and I leaned over to the to Russ who's sitting across from me. I just said, "Geez, I I want this guy to write my obituary like today. He's just amazing. You know, he wrote this." I was like, "So tell me about just tell me something. What makes Patrick unique?" And it and it really feeds into this. And he just said, "Oh Christ, yeah, oh, no. uh huh." I'm reading it. Patrick is a son. No. Um, uh, he said that he basically said you have a unique outlook on life that very little is truly impossible and I, I just it's deep it's really really deep um, so I just you probably sleep deprived or something you know, you know speaking to an audience of entrepreneurs and founders who you know like myself you know 
I build mobile games and social apps and all that stuff. Like, where does the motivation come, or, or how do you start to work on a really, really hard problem? And and um, and when it and how do you keep at it? Because you've obviously hit these very difficult steps along the way, and you guys have, have stayed with it. Yeah. Um. Uh. So, I, I think that the biggest thing that I didn't realize about you know quote unquote hard problems when I was starting out um, is that uh, they're harder in sort of like a specific way and uh, that I mean you, like you, you pick some giant challenge like say it's to fix healthcare um, and uh, and I mean just like fixing healthcare I mean it's really hard and there are all these like obstacles and bureaucracies in your way and, and it's not even clear how you should fix healthcare and all this stuff um, but it's also like all these hard problems I think are actually easier in a way which is that it's much easier to to uh, it's much easier to inspire other people to work with you, and it's much easier, I think, even to just like to, to inspire like yourself to, to work on this problem. Uh, in that, sort of, you wake up in the morning, and I mean, I don't want to pick any particular example because I think it's very easy to sort of wrongly denigrate things that look trivial. But I mean, if the thing is actually trivial, I mean, it's just sometimes you wonder, like, why am I doing this? Is that really? Is this really what I sort of thought of, you know, doing at you know whatever stage of my life? Um, whereas if you if you're doing something like really hard and really meaningful, um, I think that 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 just on, on, on some kind of like metaphysical level makes it all easier. And uh, you, I mean, you're trying to convince somebody that you really admire to work with you. And uh, I mean, if you're working on something that, that actually is trivial, I mean, you, you're kind of faintly embarrassed and you know, like you want to come work in my thing, and, but you, you can't really put your heart and soul into it. Whereas if you really are working on sort of something that your heart and soul is in fact in, um, then I think that just, that makes it easier. And so I think that like people are pretty good at dealing with, I think, like kind of the sort of mechanical challenges of, of a hard problem, and and the ones that are that are that like really cause you to lie awake at night are, are the um, the for, for for lack of a better term like the metaphysical philosophical ones or whatever. And I think that like working on hard problems it, I mean, almost definitionally uh, you know solves at least that second class in that you you picked the thing that you really think is meaningful. Um, so so I, th I think actually hard problems is actually a bad term for it because they're sort of like like hard, easy problems, um, and uh, yeah, I think that helps. Great. Can we give Patrick a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a couple of questions. Anybody have a question? And I'll just, yeah, Devin in the back, and I'll just repeat it. So, Sorry. Go yeah, go ahead. Go, say it again. Sorry. You, you mean like in the Chrome store or whatever? Yeah, like, yeah, I guess in the Chrome store. Um, like, and I don't know if they have, like, web stuff, but, um, like, where did that play, like, in the way, like, when you were working on it? Um, so, I mean, from, from the, so I guess the question just around sort of Google payments and kind of how that relates to us in a competitive sense. Um, so when we started out, uh, I mean, I mean <laughs> turns out Stripe was not, in fact, the first online payments company we realized pretty soon. Um, uh, so there was like this legacy industry of, of merchant accounts and gateways and sort of all that stuff. Um, and there was obviously PayPal. Um, Amazon had a payments product. Uh, Google had Google Checkout. Um, um, the, the, this kind of there always has been and probably will continue to be talk of like Facebook doing a payments thing. And so like basically every major technology company had like done a payments thing at some point. And so it was like a pretty crowded landscape. Um, I think that like none of these companies, including Google, sort of really care about payments at their core. Like it's not core, it's like, like Google is not a payments company, it's a search company. And I think that uh, like for anything, including payments, it's really hard to, to, do, to do anything really well sort of, uh, I mean, if, if it's not your core focus. Uh, and, and I think I mean if you if you look at Google Checkout and just like look at it as a product, I mean it's just not all that all that good a product. Um, and to, to be honest, I don't even really fully understand why. Uh, like why like large organizations are sort of not capable of building good product in sort of areas they don't care about. Um, I, I think payments. I, I think that sort of applies to almost anything. I think within like another decent example is just like uh, Quora versus Facebook questions. Like on paper, Facebook questions sort of crushed Quora, and I mean obviously it. It didn't. Um, I think with payments specifically, there's kind of a secondary aspect where the the payments companies, it seems, need to be perceived as kind of neutral, uh, and that the payments companies that have done well historically have not been 
those that sort of have their fingers in lots of pies and sort of have this weird kind of like platform layer to the payments aspect, but are also kind of somewhat competitive or whatever. And so, for example, I think Amazon Payments really has this challenge where I mean, if you're a large, if you're like Walmart, for example, why would you use Amazon Payments and like send all this data to Amazon, who are also, I mean, your competitor? Uh, and so, I mean, Google has that say less than Amazon, but I think there, there's that aspect there. And so, I think that just if you, yeah, if you look historically, the payments companies that have done best have been those that have been kind of neutral. So. Um, but I mean, ultimately, I guess it's 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 a belief thing that we think that we can build a better payment product than Google. And I mean, I guess you know, the 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 future will tell us that that's actually the case. <coughs> Anybody else? Yeah, go ahead, Jack. Talk about your view on patents. Mm. How do you how does Stripe feel about patents? Uh, I, I guess, like almost everybody else in the industry, we're um, we're pretty opposed to software patents. Um, I think that. Uh, I think it's really, well, I, I mean, the, the, the real problem with patents is, uh, like, is the kind of, the game theory of it, where, like, kind of no matter what your, um, what your belief on software patents are, you are severely disadvantaging yourself or, like, you, the company, by, by not pursuing software patents because kind of everyone else will, and it's sort of this arms race. Um, and so I think that, uh, and I think kind of to, to, to break that, uh, that kind of equilibrium, we either need to change the law or uh, just kind of change the structure in some clever way, like for example with what Twitter is doing. Uh, and I think that, that the Twitter, I mean if you actually go read the legalese, I'm not convinced that the Twitter approach is actually, um, is actually sort of the right solution that, for example, that allows offensive use of patent, patents rather, uh, even in cases where sort of the, the um, the, the defendant is sort of just believed to be a future patent threat as opposed to somebody who's actually taken a lawsuit. Um, but I, 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 I'm actually pretty, uh, th there, there are lots of things I sort of despair about, but software patents aren't one of them because I think that we're, we're just kind of living in this stupid time right now where like, we're being kind of stupid about software patents, but I think it's actually a fairly, uh, I, I think we'll fix it, and I think we'll fix it in you know, within five years. Um, because I think it's just pretty clear that software patents are a net bad idea, and I, I guess I, you know, I don't think we're capable of fixing it like terribly quickly, but I think we'll get there. So, yeah, go ahead, Young. Uh, can you be a little bit more specific about what you mean by liberate uh, from PayPal? Because I think uh, PayPal you need uh, uh, a merchant account to right. money, right? Right. So that that thing you need to uh, uh, also they have a bunch of APIs, and they mm -hmm. Yep. Right. So, so what specifically does Stripe do different yep. from PayPal? So, so, so it's a little bit hard to, um, to 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 kind of answer that question directly, just because PayPal is sort of not this like one monolithic product, but it's sort of this like large, you know, this large cluster of uh, of, of products flying in sort of loose formation. Um, and so, uh, like the the core PayPal products, when sort of people think about it, is you know this thing that appears in a website, and you you know you click pay with PayPal, you go to the PayPal website, you enter your credentials there, and you know you sort of are whirled around in the PayPal vortex for a while, and then you like end up sort of hopefully end up back. Yeah, right. Um, and you know Stripe is better than that PayPal experience because the checkout experience happens like right there on the page. It's it's like people building a site on the internet sort of want to have a payment experience that's sort of just as good as like the best sites in the internet. Like you want your payment form to look just as Well, it as feels like my payment, right? right? right it feels like right. my, if it's my products on my website, it feels like it's my yes. payment and process. And you want to be able to sort of integrate into the flow of your site sort of in, in a way that's natural and makes sense and not have to like, you know, throw people over onto these other websites and like hope they come back. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I, I think that that's kind of, uh, I guess the, the, the other part of it is that you, um, with PayPal, it's kind of this is kind of adverse um, adverse selection, kind of negative signaling problem, where you've got to look a little bit more like a mom and pop or, or you know like smaller operation if you use PayPal, just just because all the best companies insist on going and like getting a merchant account, and they're willing to invest the weeks that it takes to to do that. Um, and so so we're sort of better than sort of that particular PayPal product because uh, I mean we, we sort of provide the the first class experience. Um, but I mean th there are other PayPal products, and it, it's I mean. It's hard to kind of go through them one by one, but I, I think the kind of at a meta level, um, we're, uh, we we feel that Stripe is a, a more compelling product than PayPal because, like, not so much because of sort of a feature list comparison, though you know we can do that feature list comparison. I think Stripe does very well in that, but just kind of at a like, if you, if you compare um, if you compare the iPhone and Android on like a feature checklist, 
that they look like basically the same product. And yet if you use an iPhone and an Android phone for, for five minutes, like it, it, it's night and day. Like they, they are just such different products and just have such, such radically different kind of the quality of execution and, and like it's, you know, and I user think there, experience. I, th I think there are valid reasons to choose Android, you know, things like the app review process and you know, like all that stuff, but just like they're very different things. And I'm not claiming that sort of Stripe is iPhone and PayPal is the Android, but just kind of there's kind of um, there's something philosophical um, in, the, in these products, the iPhone and the Android, that just like differ. And it's hard to sort of put your finger on exactly what it is, but it's there. And so with Stripe, we, we have a very firm belief that sort of like what this product is and how the payment should work. It should be a really simple API. It should be integrated onto your website. Everything should be really fast and beautiful and simple. And with PayPal, they have like tons of different products and different permutations and like different pricing schedules and the, you know, the interface is a little bit dated and all these things. But like it's not one single thing that separates them. It's just kind of this, this you know, underlying philosophy. Um, so I'm not sure that actually answers the question, but. Better comparison yeah. might be Stripe is like iPhone to PayPal, it's BlackBerry, kind of like that. <laughs> that's kind of how I look at it. I mean, that's my two cents. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Ex PayPal guy, right here. So yeah, let's hear it. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of them. What are your thoughts on Chirpify? Enabling payments on Twitter, like Gumroad, kind of like that. Um, so. So, so I don't know Chirpify super well. I mean, I've, I've looked at their website, um, but I, I'm not all that familiar with the product. But I think that the, uh, <laughs> no, I'm going to try to dodge the question and said talk about the the, uh, the the general concept here, mostly because I'm just not all that familiar with Chirpify. But sort of uh, at a meta level, I guess, um, Chirpify is sort of uh, building kind of, or helping build or facilitate kind of more lightweight forms of commerce uh, in that, you know, commerce need not be sort of going to Amazon and putting a thing in your cart and basically like a recreation of a supermarket experience online, but it can be something sort of much more casual and just like, you know, buying something at a stand or something. Uh, and, and I think on a kind of, on a, on a philosoph philosophical level, that's, th that's a really promising direction. And that I think that sort of the internet of 10 years time when we ha have this sort of better economic foundation, whatever it looks like, um, Will it, it's not that we'll sort of we'll be making much more sort of three hundred dollar purchases. It's that I think we'll be making much more casual purchases and just kind of giving value to way more people and just having a much lower kind of activation energy there. And to the extent that sort of Tripify is doing things like that by integrating it into Twitter, I think that that's that is a really promising avenue. So I guess that's what I feel. Yeah, go ahead. So what are what are some of the solutions that you have in place to deal with fraud? Right. Um, so I, I think this question is actually really interesting because um, kind of when people think of online payments, one of the first things they think of is fraud because I mean everyone's kind of heard the horror stories from PayPal um, and, and sort of like in, in how they almost went out of business, you know, because of the Russian mob and, and mm -hmm. like all these crazy stories. Um, and I think that a lot of the kind of the subtlety of the stories has been lost a little bit um, in that, for example, with PayPal. Uh, even at their time, the times of sort of their greatest losses, they actually had a pretty good idea of where the fraud was coming from and even how they could how they could mitigate it. But they sort of made the determination in hindsight correctly that uh, that they could afford the losses and the kind of additional growth that they got by sort of taking on these kind of somewhat suspect users. It was just worth it. Um, and and eventually they sort of got better at sort of detecting the fraud and, and you know, it, it became less of a problem. And if you look at PayPal's fraud losses today, they're, they're actually very low. I, I do think still that, that um, uh, well, and alongside PayPal then, I mean, pay, PayPal processes a, a very small fraction of all, of all online transactions. Like the vast majority are processed by this kind of legacy infrastructure, again, of merchant accounts and gateways and everything else. And these companies, you know, they don't have these um, insanely brilliant sort of mathematicians and programmers and ML people and big data people sort of uh, curating these models. I mean, they, they apply a fairly simplistic uh, approach to fraud and, and just tur turns out that that actually works. Um, and so, 
uh, I, I think that I mean fraud is, is just not the um, the kind of existentially challenging problem for an online payments company that people tend to to kind of extrapolate from the PayPal experience to assume mm. that it is. Um, I do think the mis I think one of the mistakes that PayPal's made on fraud is that they just don't like I I, I feel like they look at it sort of from a very mathematical standpoint and uh, they they sort of think oh well if if I shut down this user you know there is X probability that I'm wrong that they're um, they're a false positive, um, and, uh, and you know, like the the loss in that case of making an incorrect decision is the loss of the sort of the profit that I make on this user. Uh, whereas, of course, that's not the loss. The loss that you make is the giant reputational hit from somebody talking about PayPal and telling their friends and like sharing this experience of how PayPal, like, like literally in many cases, took away their livelihood. Uh, and I think that sort of that that sort of short-sighted or like miscalibrated mathematical model is is actually a very dangerous way to to model fraud. And so we're really conscious of that at Stripe. And I think that um, yeah, I mean we, we we can do some things to to sort of convince you that we're trustworthy and safe and everything else. And you know we're audited to the most stringent sort of security levels possible. And we we've hired people like. We've hired people from other companies who have spent tons of time dealing with fraud and you know know the industry really well and and this kind of stuff. But but I think ultimately what it boils down to is we do not intend to have these stories appear of like how Stripe took away my livelihood. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that like uh, a, a lot of it comes down to that, and that we we simply. Um, we're not willing to make those mistakes, and that we're not willing to look at sort of an individual user's loss as being, you know, the loss of that profit. I think it's, it's much, much larger than that. Um, but yeah, I, I guess cu coupled with that, I guess very sort of emphatic um, view of the the downside of being wrong on fraud. The 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 slightly more um, uh, encouraging side is that, you know, it's pretty hard, but it's not quite as hard as I think everyone assumes. So hopefully we'll do okay. Great. Can we give Patrick a big round of applause?